tapestry of life stories are woven together with the threads of life's ties, ever breaking and joining. These 17 words by the poet Rabindranath Tagore have shaped my own philosophy of tapestry thinking, the weaving together of disparate parts of society in order to make a, a qualified whole and to address problems that we're concerned with. These are like real tapestries, complex, connected, useful, strong, and beautiful. But the world we live in today is not connected. We live in a fragmented world with many threads that don't intersect. Our professions, our hobbies, our political beliefs, the spiritual pathways that we walk. We need to create community tapestries, each thread constituting a deep way of knowing with intersections that allow for connections and strength. Today, I'll talk about three ideas. First, I'll share with you my own inspiration, the magnificent tapestries of rainforest ecosystems. Second, I'll explain to you how I've used tapestry thinking to raise awareness of the importance of trees to human beings. And third, I'll invite you to think about how you might apply tapestry thinking to problems that you're concerned with. So first, the rainforest tapestry. Well, I drew upon my childhood love of climbing trees to focus on the study of the forest canopy, the plants and animals that live high above the forest floor and the treetops. I've learned that the, the rainforest canopy is very like Tagore's tapestry, with elements that are forever breaking and joining. Hummingbirds fly through the forest, connecting plant to plant. Emerald toucanets transport seeds to new safe spots for the next generation. I've also learned that the forest canopy-dwelling plants can intercept and retain water and nutrients in mist and fog that bathe them, and then moving these elements to other part of the rainforest so that they constitute really the magnificent rainforest cycles. But strong and complex those these forest tapestries might be, they are vulnerable to human activities, to forest fragmentation, to global climate change, and to our own overuse of rainforest resources. As a scientist, and these wear out the fragile fabric of the rainforest. Many of us, especially those who live in urban settings, are very divorced from rainforest ecosystems and therefore don't pay that much attention to rainforest conservation. As an academic myself, I have come to be trained to use the narrow monochrome thread of science to understand rainforests. And I know that this is not sufficient to convince those who are not already tuned into nature to preserve forest ecosystems. I need to find other threads, other perspectives, other parts of society that they care about in order to strengthen the, the tapestry of conservation. So what I'd like to do is right now to tell you, sort of shift the stage away from the sort of the strength and fragility of rainforests to talk about tapestry thinking. What I'd like to do is to describe to you how I've used the, or woven the thread of forest conservation with three other threads in society. One is the medical profession, the second thread is that of fashion, and the third one is that of prisons and jails and incarceration, which, you know, at first glance seem like completely unrelated uh, topics and rather strange bedfellows to put together. But I'll show you, I hope, that we can create synergistic fabrics from these threads. I'll start with the medical profession. And as uh, Sumiko told you, um, I have sort of a personal story to bring into this. Two months ago, I was carrying out canopy research in the Olympic National Park. I was climbing trees with my graduate students, collecting specimens, and I had the first climbing accident in the 36 years of climbing that I've ever experienced. My rope broke and I fell 50 feet. That's the equivalent of a five-story building to the forest below. With the help of doctors and the threads of warmth and concern of my families and friends that actually knit together a tapestry that helped me recover, I've made a fairly quick recovery. But as with other patients who suffered trauma, I spent my days and nights in the intensive care unit. And that is a place of great stress, 
of great anxiety and which is completely bereft of any connections to nature. And somewhat prophetically, a few years ago, I began trying to use tapestry thinking to knit together the world of trees with the world of healing. And what I did was I gave talks to students in medical schools all over the country, trying to help them understand this link, this important connection that they might incorporate into their practice in the future. One of the things that I talked about was the direct link of medicinal, uh, medicinally active drugs that are contained in trees to create medications. And one example of this is the Pacific yew tree, and its bark is used to create Taxol, which is one of the most important medicines that has been used to combat ovarian cancer that's been developed in the last 50 years. I also told the medical students that the psychological aspects of trees can also participate in healing. In 1984, the behavioral psychologist, Roger Ulrich, elegantly demonstrated that those patients who had a view of trees out their window recovered faster with fewer complications and fewer complaints than those patients who had views of a concrete wall out their window. And further research has shown that, in fact, views of nature or even nature imagery can reduce stress, reduce anxiety, and speed healing. In fact, there are a number of companies now that actually create virtual views of nature for those hospitals that don't actually have them. Well, I began to use tapestry thinking to extend to other parts of the hospital. I began thinking about the clothing that medical people wear, and as I realized that the scrubs that doctors and nurses wear, the gowns that patients are forced to put on, are really pretty sterile, as sterile as the hospital environment itself. And I began thinking of ways where I could knit together views of nature, not through the window, but actually on the clothing that people in hospitals wear. With a grant from the National Science Foundation, my fashion colleagues uh, and I uh, worked with the Shriners Children's Hospital here in the avenues in Salt Lake City. And we designed, designed gowns for kids who are patients there that have images of trees and images of lions on them, along with information about the species that are depicted on their gowns. The surveys that we conducted shows that the, show that the, pa the doctors, the nurses, the families, and the kids themselves thought very highly of these gowns. And so now we are weaving this idea into creating nature imagery gowns in other hospitals. Well, I started figuring, again, thinking that with tapestry thinking, one thread very often leads to another. And I began thinking that if nature imagery worked to raise awareness of the importance to trees inside hospitals, perhaps it could work outside hospitals. So I began thinking of how fashion could be woven into this tapestry of forest conservation. As it turns out, fashion is incredibly important to us. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Why is that? Because the clothing we wear identify and, in many ways, defy, define us. They convey who we want to be. And so, I've been developing a line with my fashion designers, a line of botanically correct clothing that depicts accurate representations of plants and animals in the environment. And you can see that this jacket that I'm wearing, one of our first lines of this, examples of our first lines of this uh, clothing line, um, actually started with an image of Piper Auretum. That is a canopy-dwelling plant in Costa Rica. It's related to the Piper nigrum, which is the black pepper plant that you, you shake on your scrambled eggs in the morning. Uh, and we then sewed it into a jacket with a hang tag that describes its biology and its conservation. So when I wear this jacket, sitting down in a coffee shop or walking down the street, and somebody is interested in the aesthetics of this jacket, I can tell them about the biology of the species, it's related to the black pepper plant that you shake on your scrambled eggs in the morning. Um, and I can also tell them how they might participate in its conservation. So that is the, we've been able to weave together the threads of fashion and forest conservation, much like the rainforest tapestry itself. Well, I think that we need to ask now, how does tapestry thinking relate to this theme of upcycled thinking that all of us in TEDx have been concerned with today? That is, to create a new product that is of higher value than the original. And to answer this question, I'd like to give you an example of a, 
um, of a project that my colleagues and I use tapestry thinking to do in order to bring science and nature to those who many would consider are the lowest stratum of society and to think how we might use science and nature to upcycle them. And I'm talking here about the 2.3 million incarcerated men and women we have in the United States today. Men and women who are held apart from those activities that might in fact upcycle them. Access to higher education, access to vocational training, access to the benefits that being with nature might present. I used tapestry thinking to start a, a prison project called the Sustainability in Prison Project. I started with a science lecture series in a single prison in Washington state. Um, this was very useful because researchers came to the prison, they gave a lecture, and they were able to convey information about science and nature to a, preview, to a very underserved audience. But it was also important because it also allowed the inmates to articulate their own knowledge and their own experience with science and nature to the researchers. So they were able to upscale themselves from a self-identity of being a convict up to being a science learner and a science teacher. Our sustainability lectures actually inspired a number of sustainability projects behind bars. We started organic gardening behind bars. We started worm composting. We started recycling programs. We started beekeeping in prisons. We also engaged conservation uh, professionals who taught inmates how to rear the endangered species of the Oregon spotted frog from egg to tadpole to adult. And the inmates were able to carry this out with an 85% survivorship rate, which was higher than any other captive rearing facility in Washington state. Adult frogs were released in the wild by conservation professionals, and so the inmates, although still imprisoned, were able to contribute to the success of a species that was on the brink of extinction. Prisoners and inmates in other uh, facilities, other correctional facilities, carried out other projects. For example, uh, they're growing um, endangered prairie plants at the Stafford Creek Correction Center, 300,000 plugs a year. The women inmates in the women's prison of Washington are rearing the Taylor Checker Spot butterfly, a federally listed species. And here in Utah, my students and staff and I have started our own version of the Sustainability in Prisons project. We now have a monthly science lecture series at the Draper State Prison and at the Salt Lake County Jail. And in the Salt Lake County Jail, we've collaborated with the Division of Wildlife Resources. The jail has dug this giant refuge pond and the least chub, the inmates are raising the least chub, which is a very small state sensitive fish. So the wildlife managers are taking the fish that the inmates raise and replenishing the depleted populations of this little fish throughout the state. So all of these activities I have witnessed have contributed to the threads of connection between individuals and also among organizations. This has now been, uh, this, this idea of the Sustainability in Prisons Project has spread to over 25 prisons in nine states. And the media has been very interested in this. We've had stories about our project in journals as widely, sort of widely scattered as Science Magazine uh, and also Playboy. Um, <laughs> and I've been very, very happy with these successes. I think it's been just great. But actually, just a few years after we started it, I realized that we were missing a significant part of the prison population. We were not providing access to nature to them. And those are the inmates who are sequestered in solitary confinement. Um, we cannot bring butterflies and soils and plants and frogs and lecturers to them. So I had to use tapestry thinking to think about how we could weave the benefits of being close to nature with those who were sequestered in solitary confinement. In 2009, I approached, remembering what I knew about uh, what Roger Ulrich had demonstrated, that in fact exposure to nature imagery can bring down stress and, and anxiety and perhaps even violence, I approached a maximum security prison in, the, uh, in Washington state and proposed to them installing nature imagery uh, in the exercise rooms of their solitary confinement inmates. The officers decided that they did not want to have anything to do with this because it would look like they were coddling the prisoners. 
Well, in 2010, I gave a TED talk about this idea, just sort of throwing it out there, not really expecting any response. And to my amazement, two years after that talk, I got a phone call from a prison officer at the Snake River Correctional Institution in Eastern Oregon. He had seen the TED talk, and he wanted to implement it in his institution. I visited the prison, and we implemented and evaluated a program of showing nature imagery videos to the prisoners in solitary confinement. In this prison, there are six cell blocks of solitary confinement, and we chose one of them, cell block F, to install a projector and to show these videos. We first uh, talked to the men and established which biomes, which habitats they found most calming, and then got videos to match those habitats. We were most concerned with trying to reduce the violent infractions, that is, an inmate punching a guard or an inmate throwing feces at a staff member. And after a year of showing these videos, we compared the rate of violent infractions of those inmates who had seen the nature videos in, in cell block F with those inmates, with the number of violent infractions of those inmates uh, in the other cell blocks. These are some preliminary results. It turned out that the only cell block of all six cell blocks where there was a decrease in violent infractions was cell block F, where we had shown these nature videos. We also carried out surveys of the inmates uh, about this process. The, the results were mixed. One inmate wrote, this prison and every program sucks. But others were more favorable, and I'll just read you one of these. He said, prison is prison, but nature videos in solitary is an awesome and engaging practice. However, it is not the solution to confining human beings for extended periods of time. Thank you for your efforts. The voiceless are being heard. So we believe that this is a potential intervention that can bring down stress and anxiety and violence and provide an upscaling of, it, of activities for those who are most in need of it. So I've shown you how we're beginning to make a tapestry of sorts with these uh, different uh, fields within society, but I think there's really quite a few other fields that we could include in using in tapestry thinking, many of which you've actually heard about today during our TEDx. And I'd like to share some ideas, four ideas with you that might make that successful. First, you will need a loom, some sort of structural organization that will allow you to fasten the threads that you've assembled for stability and for continuity. Second, you need to pick the right partners. Just as a tapestry is not some bag with random fibers in it, nor is tapestry thinking made up with collaborators, they must be able to find some mutual benefit in all of these. Third, we must heed Tagore's quote that states that threads are always breaking and joining. And so you must be prepared when relationships shift, when staff shifts, when politics shift, that there are going to be changes in the entities that you create, and I think that's okay. And finally, I'd like to say, you should be open to the mysteries and to the surprises that tapestry thinking creates. Be confident that you will enlist the right loom, that you will partner with the right partners, and that you will know when it is time to release or to beckon to a new partner. Tapestry thinking for me has allowed me to weave threads of forest conservation into many threads of society. Scientists, doctors, nurses, patients, fashion designers, prison officials, prison officers, inmates, and endangered frogs. I have learned that when the health of the earth and the health of the human spirit is at stake, we can create societal tapestries that are complex, connected, useful, strong, and beautiful. Thank you.